inviting me. Uh, I've got two caveats. Number one, the title is incorrect. It says trans barriers to translation. So I have to tell you I'm not a linguist, and then I also have to tell you I'm not a stem cell scientist. But when um, uh, Anne um, emphasized to me not to be confrontational, and, uh, <laughs> and so um, I said, well, you know, usually I speak, I have a protective barrier, and I hope this works. It doesn't look like it's going to work. Oh, that's too bad. Whoops. Let's try it again. There we go. Is it working? No, you got to click it. Click it, yeah. You're good. Because you may remember this from the Blues Brothers. And I was looking to see if there was a protective screen here when they... No. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'm going to talk a little about um, clinical trials and the experience that we had over uh, almost uh, 20 years. And in part, I'm going to key off of this um, article that was in the Lancet on the effect of U.S. National, uh, the NIH uh, sponsored clinical trials and uh, the costs and, and cost savings to the public. And we were fortunate of the 28. Uh, trials that they highlighted, uh, uh, we were either uh, the PIs, uh, principal centers, or uh, very much involved. So in this article by uh, uh, Claiborne Johnson, uh, the goal was to estimate the public return on investment. And they uh, reviewed 28 NAT NIH uh, sponsored trials, which cost uh, $335 million which seems a lot of money, uh, <coughs> even to a neurosurgeon. And, and um, uh, there was 21% uh, um, measured improvement in health, and 14% resulted in cost savings to society. And the conclusion was that in 10 years, the projected net benefit to society was $15 billion. So that's a significant uh, in, uh, uh, return on investment. Now, of those trials, uh, I'm just going to go through three, um, which I was the PI uh, that was run out of the University of Washington. The first was uh, evaluation of phenytoin or dilantin versus placebo in head trauma, which uh, we eventually published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, the background it is as follows, that uh, anticonvulsants were routinely uh, recommended and prescribed for any head injury or any subarachnoid hemorrhage or in fact after any craniotomy for upwards of 6 to 12 months. But there was absolutely no data that was supportive of that uh, convention that uh, posed a real question to us at the time. And the hypothesis was, does uh, anticonvulsive therapy prevent post-traumatic seizures? I have to say that this was not translational uh, medicine, actually, or investigation. It was really just an attempt to, uh, to, to investigate standard uh, treatment. And the method was a single institution uh, analysis of 404 patients that were randomized in a double-blinded trial to either phenytoin or placebo, uh, and then uh, followed for 12 months, uh, for, for, treated for 12 months, months and then followed for uh, up to two years. And we initiated the drug uh, in less than 24 hours. And what we found um, was that in the first week, Dilantin was successful in, pre in preventing seizures, but lo and behold, and this shows the data here, that uh, in treatment you had 3.6% incidence of seizures, whereas in the placebo arm, uh, there was 14%, but in the long term, that is, the patients were treated for 12 months and then the drug uh, stopped, that there was no protective effect of uh, phenytoin or dilantin. So the conclusion was phenytoin exists a beneficial effect only uh, during the first week, but not thereafter. And so that dramatically changed clinical practice in neurology and neurosurgery. We then followed that on with the second anticonvulsant, valproate, 
But then we, since we had established uh, the criteria uh, for treatment with uh, phenytoin, we tested Valproate uh, against uh, phenytoin and not against placebo. And I forgot to point out the dollar figure initial trial was about 3.6 million. Now it's 5.4 million. Uh, this trial started about seven years later. And, and you will see in all of these trials, I'll run through the NASIS trials, there's a doubling of costs within about six years. We, uh, uh, I'll just go briefly over the Valpro-8 uh, trial, which we published in, in 99. The study was a randomized, double-blinded, single-center, uh, parallel group clinical trial. Treatment again started within 24 hours, and there were three randomized, blinded groups. 132 patients, one week on phenytoin, that was the now accepted uh, clinical practice. 120 uh, patients with one month course of valpro -A, and then 127 uh, patients given only six months of valpro -A, and the cases, the patients were then followed uh, for up to two years. And we found that, lo and behold, just like uh, phenytoin, there was no uh, difference among all three groups during the acute period. They all protected against acute seizures, but in the long run, there was no difference among the three groups. In other words, phenytoin uh, <coughs> was no more effective than phenytoin in pre preventing uh, late seizures. So there are two uh, so-called positive uh, uh, clinical trials, but now we ran into, uh, we decided we'd take on something uh, more profound, so to speak, and this was translational medicine, and that was to study the protect, protection by magnesium uh, following traumatic brain injury. And by now, uh, this, this, report, this study was reported out in uh, 2007 in neurology, or in Lancet, and uh, the costs were up to close to 13 million. Now, why study uh, magnesium? Uh, and that's because uh, there's excellent uh, preclinical studies demonstrating that the pathophysiology of severe brain injury involves a primary event and frequently subsequently uh, secondary events. And as you'll see, um, there are multiple studies demonstrating that magnesium drops in, in the central nervous system, in injured and normal tissue, in CSF and blood and that uh, looking at the primary and secondary events, and I would bring this up as a marker as to why brain and spinal cord are different. In brain, it's clear you have a um, primary event and then secondary events which can adversely affect the primary event. That's less likely in the spinal cord, not absent, but less likely and less frequent. So theoretically, these secondary insults uh, are amenable to therapy, which has encouraged investigators to explore new uh, treatment options and search for the uh, Zalbunkukul, uh, which Paul Ehrlich, who uh, was a Nobel laureate in uh, 1908, he was searching for the cure for syphilis, as was most of the uh, uh, scientists in uh, the Western world, because it was the scourge. Uh, and they were all searching for this uh, Zauberkugel, which was the magic bullet. So I heard that and I thought, well, maybe the Lone Ranger knows something about it because here are, his, as we all remember, he had silver bullets, which were the magic bullet. So let's look at some of the basic science because I'm going to go on to criticize uh, the translational aspect uh, of investigation. But uh, let's look at the um, basic science data supporting a push into the clinical area to study magnesium. There were multiple basic science studies have documented that serum magnesium and brain magnesium are decreased following experimental TBI, uh, traumatic brain injury. And I am not going to go into the spinal cord data, but there's similar data in the spinal cord. Magnesium supplementation improves outcome whether given before, shortly after, or hours after injury. Outcome is worse in brain-injured animals with artificially lowered magnesium 
intermediate in animals with no intentional alteration in the level of magnesium and best in animals given supplementary doses of magnesium. Much of this, these, this work was done by Vink and his associates. And treatment with magnesium can, success, can, can be successful when it's administered up to 24 hours following injury and whether administrator, administered as a single bolus or for up to seven days. Very appealing uh, uh, Zauberkuchen. <laughs> and then it's been shown uh, by uh, Maiman and his colleagues, including uh, Burton Artuler, Ar 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 uh, who was uh, early into magnesium, uh, published several articles in science in the 50s and 60s about magnesium, that falling head injury in humans, total uh, uh, serum total and ionized magnesium is decreased. So with that background, we said, okay, let's go for it. And the proposed mechanisms uh, for magnesium in ameliorating the secondary injuries are as follows. There's a decrease in presynaptic excitation, excitatory transmitter release with magnesium. Magnesium decreases uh, NMDA channel activity. It decreases voltage-gated calcium channels. It decreases cortical spreading depression. It increases presynaptic adenosine activity. I always try and work in uh, adenosine in any of my talks since uh, my lab has been focused on that for 40 years. And it decreases, <laughs> and, and it's true in this case. Um, <laughs> and it decreases the tone of vascular smooth muscle, i.e. it causes uh, vessels to dilate. If you ever wanted the magic bullet, this should be it. So our primary hypothesis was, in moderate or severe head injured patients, magnesium sulfate given within eight hours and for five days will improve survival, uh, seizure occurrence, and, neuro and improve uh, neurobehavioral function. And we were lucky because for decades, magnesium sulfate had been uh, used uh, by the obstetricians. So the, the safety issues were not a factor for us at all. And the secondary aims were to assess the effects of timing, less than four hours, four to eight hours, and so forth, gender, race, adverse effects. Now, in regard to the patients, they were head injured patients, Glasgow Coma Scale 3 to 12, or motor 1 to 5 if intubated, uh, double blinded, single uh, center. Uh, the magnesium uh, was administered within eight hours of injury and continued for five days. The dosage is as you uh, see up here, but we went for a high and uh, low dose. The high dose was uh, 1.75 millimol per liter. Uh, we, that was achieved in 118 randomized patients and a low dose of 1.4, in, that's uh, supposed to be 130 to a uh, total of 250 on the treatment arm and uh, 249 patients in the placebo trial in which if, they came, if the patient's magnesium went way down, we normalized it up uh, to, as you'll see, uh, a level that did not, uh, it was not thought to impair uh, or adversely affect their outcome. So here's the trial. Uh, we acquired patients uh, from 1998 to uh, 2004. Um, time to treatment average 5.4 hours. The randomization was well balanced except for the low magnesium group where we had more intracerebral hematomas. So what happened? Well, the silver bullet did not <coughs> work. Um, and this shows more cumulative survival we had uh, two placebo arms to match the two treatment arms. Here's the low dose magnesium, here's the high dose magnesium, and if you look, it turns out there's a statistically significant difference, and that is that the patients given the higher dose of magnesium did worse than the placebo. But there was no improvement even in the low dose magnesium group. And if you look at the expanded Glasgow outcome score here, uh, broken down into eight categories. 
you can see that there, here's the patients dying compared to the placebo. Same here, but this was not statistically significant. So what are the potential explanations for the lack of effect of magnesium? Um, and I, I will tell you in advance that now they're, they're subsequent to our study. There was a study in stroke. There's been a study in subarachnoid hemorrhage, and none of them have shown that magnesium is effective. So in our study, we address the potential explanation. One, asymmetric randomization. Uh, sub, uh, and subdurals were a little uh, asymmetrically randomized, but only in the low magnesium group. There were no differences in subgroup group analysis or in the high magnesium group. So we concluded failure of randomization or protocol violation could not explain the negative effect. Inadequate power. Uh, the study was designed 80% uh, power to detect 10% difference between the groups. We were successfully demonstrated significant adverse effects of magnesium, so we concluded the power of the study was significant. What about the effects on, on blood pressure? As we, the higher dose is only seen in the higher uh, treatment group, and we couldn't go higher because it would have unblocked the study. They lose the reflexes and so forth. So we con concluded that blood pressure alone cannot explain the failure of magnesium to predict. What about dosage and dosing schedule? Um, the higher dose, again, would, as I indicated, would unblind the study. Adverse effects on blood pressure and outcome, we could not do an even higher dose. Dosing schedule, timing, no difference in outcome if we uh, uh, dichotomize uh, the outcome into those treated less than four hours and greater than four hours. The duration, we continued it for five days, and this may be the explanation. Is there a negative effect? And what happens with, uh, when you elevate the magnesium? Uh, first of all, glutamate NMDA receptor hyperactivity occurs within the first hours after experimental uh, brain injury not from magnesium. It normally happens as a response to the injury. Stimulation of NMDA receptors at 24 and 48 hours after injury result in improvement of outcome, as uh, shown in this paper uh, in the Proceedings of the National Academy. High levels of magnesium for 24 to 48 hours will thus attenuate NMDA stimulation and adversely affect recovery. So we concluded the following, that is, too much of a good thing is bad. We, th we suspect this may be the explanation. And then uh, another factor was uh, because of safety considerations, we were forced to normalize uh, the patients in the placebo uh, arm up to a level that was thought to be um, adequate. Perhaps if we hadn't done that, we might have been able to show an improvement. And I think it's, to some degree that melody is similar to what you face in spinal cord injury studies also. So it, this was a double-blinded single institutional trial designed to test the hypothesis that magnesium given within eight hours of significant head injury would attain, attenuate mortality and improve functioning. And using a broad array of measures, we failed to prove our hypothesis. And although uh, Virchow in 1880 stated that the absence of proof doesn't constitute the proof of absence, nevertheless, we would conclude there's no clinical suggestion that these regimes of magnesium are useful in the treatment of significant head injuries. So that was uh, some uh, clinical trials in, in uh, brain injury. I suspect everybody in the room uh, are aware of the NASIS um, trials that went on beginning in the um, late 80s and extending uh, through the 90s uh, that Mike Brackett uh, led uh, and provided uh, along with Bill Collins major leadership as did uh, Dr. Young and um, uh, these were really um, trials that I think 
everybody in the neurology, neuroscience, neurosurgery community really looked at with great interest and high expectations. The first trial did not show an advantage of methylprednisolone. Uh, and I'm not going to say too much about that. In fact, I'm not going to say too much about these others because I think everyone knows. But almost for historical reasons, I'll throw up a few slides. This uh, study was um, uh, published in 1990 in the New England Journal of Medicine on the randomized control trial of methylprednisolone or, nilox and, or naloxone in the treatment of acute spinal cord injury. And again, this was built on, at the time, I think, state-of-the-art, very, very convincing data. And I'm going to make some comments subsequent about the preclinical trials. Strong indication that uh, methylprednisolone was going to be effective. And in these sets of trials, it turned out preclinical data held up. So the laboratory studies indicated that methylprednisolone and naloxone are both potentially beneficial in acute uh, spinal cord injury, but whether any treatment is clinically effective remains uncertain. That's uh, w when the trials got started. It was multi-centered, uh, and I'll make some comments about whether single institution or multi-institution trials uh, have, should be uh, favored. There are advantages on each side of that question. But this was a double-blinded trial of three groups. 95% of them were treated within 14 hours. And the treatment was methylpred as a bolus, uh, and then followed by an infusion, <coughs> and naloxone, a bolus, an infusion for 23 hours, or a placebo with a placebo bolus uh, and infusion in 171 patients. And the patients were assessed on admission at six weeks and six months. And I remember going to many meetings in the Chicago airport uh, in the middle of winter, uh, thrashing out all these uh, sorts of things. And here's what the results were. At six months, patient given methylprednisolone in less than eight hours had significant improvement compared to placebo. And I, I'm gonna, I should have put in quotes, significant, because eventually this study has been attacked and continues to be attacked as to the relevance of that improvement. But in any event, there was improvement compared to placebo in motor function and sensation, i.e. to pin and touch. And both complete and incomplete patients improved. And in contrast, uh, niloxone did not show any benefit. And the uh, conclusion, uh, and I again, put this up for historical reasons. This may not be valid now that we have more, uh, more scientific uh, heft in regard to the mechanism, but it was thought that, it, it, that the methylprednisolone was suppressing the breakdown of membranes by inhibiting lipid peroxidation uh, and hydrolysis. So with that, they then went on to uh, NASIS uh, 3, which looked at short duration or long duration, and both were effective uh, and that found that patients with acute spinal cord injury who received methylprednisolone within three hours of injury should be maintained on treatment regime for 24 hours, and when methylpred is initiated after three hours and up to eight hours, uh, patients should be maintained on steroids for 48 hours. So that these, this, this, I think, would be viewed uh, as a successful clinical trial and a successful translational uh, aspect uh, of preclinical work. So let me just give you some randomized, uh, th random thoughts on randomized trial. Phil and I exchanged emails and he was encouraging me to come in here and stir things up, but I see that, you know, that protective uh, Barrier's not here, so I, okay, now that's what I wanted to hear. There's nothing like a, you know, someone who trained at UVA to, uh, right, standard. Uh. So wh why uh, do our clinical trials fail? And in particular, as you'll see, why do they fail when we have what appears to be pretty good preclinical data? So I think failures are relate to diversity. 
diversity of the injury and uh, the preceding speakers, I think, all spoke, have uh, alluded very specifically about some of these uh, aspects. So the extent or duration of the human injury in traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, stroke, subarachnoid hemorrhage, although subarachnoid hemorrhage from an aneurysm, probably a more consistent uh, type of insult and may be uh, l less affected by variation. But as a consequence of this diversity, uh, you've got to uh, you've got to come overcome it if you're going to find a statistically significant effect of therapy. So that means you've got to have enormous N in your trials. And uh, most trials are underpowered and not of sufficient size to overcome this uh, diversity. And six, another thing, and we heard about it in the Asia and the worthless uh, spinal cord evaluation. That's not my quote. I wanna, <laughs> don't want to take credit for it. <laughs> yeah, but six, uh, success by clinicians in predicting outcome uh, is really not that good. It's only good 100%, and it's not, never 100%. It's in the high 90s. Uh, at the extremes, let me give you an example. Here's a study we looked at, I think 500 uh, aneurysms, of which about 200 were poor grade aneurysms. These patients are in extremists. And we said, we looked at uh, about 200 different parameters. And then we asked wise, not <coughs> this wise, but wise clinicians, tell us what you think is going to happen to grade four and grade five aneurysm patients. They were wrong 30% of the time, even though we had over 200 parameters to look at and evaluate. So that, that was pretty shocking uh, to us. Grading scales, we've heard about. Grading scales for spinal cord injury, subarachnoid hemorrhage, stroke, traumatic brain injury are not precise enough to allow accurate sorting. And, 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 but, you know, when you look at the studies, you see, oh, grade one, grade two, grade three. Well, there's a lot of diversity in grade one, and some of the, at the extreme, may be grade two. So it, that really, that inability to sort out precisely adversely affects the investigator in coming up with a clear answer on clinical trial. Imaging studies. Um, I hate to date myself, but when I got started, Rankin had just developed x-rays. Okay? <laughs> That's all we had, x-rays. Then CTs. We thought that's the nirvana. That's going to be able to precisely demark the extent of disease. Couldn't. MR, DTI, et cetera, et cetera. Ladies and gentlemen, it's, they, they really cannot uh, absolutely define the anatomic and physiologic changes in these injuries, especially in the spinal cord, I don't think. We, there may be things in the future. They're not here now. Diversity in the human gene pool. We, we never talk about that. I mean, we may, uh, but not in polite circles, right? <laughs> but we, we don't think about it. There's no question we think about APOE and so forth. But I want to, there are unrecognized differences. Now, I know I'm uh, taking a chance here to present this data in Boston, but let's look at um, the baseball teams. What would you rather have, a group of 20-year-olds or 40-year-olds? The 40-year-olds, the Yankees can give you the answer to that. So let's just look here. Here's, here's the highest paid baseball player. And I point this out not to heap abuse on A-Rod, although I would like to after this season. But what do you do in these studies? Oh, people under 50 versus people over 50 or under 20 to 40. Here's a guy, and I'm going to show you the data, all right? Superb athlete, with or without steroids. Here he is, age 22, zero, uh, 352 batting average. average. 
Here he is playing for Texas. Now he's 26, 300. Here he is playing for, should have been the World Series winners, uh, age 35, 280. Now, here's the data. Here is the data. And like any good scientist, I looked at the one data here, didn't quite fit with my uh, prejudice. I threw this data out. So now, no, uh, you know, early on, his first year, he didn't bat, get up to bat that much. But look, and yet, we're talking age 21 to 38, that would be, in every study, young, right? And this is a highly trained athlete who, without question, has had a deterioration in both muscle but neuro. I mean, if anybody has stood up at the plate and seen a ball... What about Roger Clemens? His career took off after he left Boston. Well, that was with steroids. I, but I discussed... <laughs> I, I discussed steroids. We're, at, we're out of the but steroid study. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's true. That's true. It just goes to show you. Right. You do anything with money, right? But the point I'm trying to make is that with, there's no question that this grouping uh, of, uh, as we characterize patients, may not be sufficiently precise for us to, to sort out the patients. And the more you split the cells, the greater the end's going to have to be. So um, here's another unsaid thing. Diversity in treatment intensity in multi-institutional trials, frequently undetected. If you're running a clinical trial, you know there's only so much you can put into the protocol for in a multi-institutional trial. You rarely talk about intensity of nursing. You rarely talk about what happens as the fever goes up, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that, that can uh, play a role in the smudging of um, the data so that you can't discern a difference. There's um, the marginal effects of the treatments that we have now. We are not giving penicillin uh, and, you know, for pneumococcal pneumonia, which had a dramatic effect, which leads to the next question I would raise, and that is the tradition that we've had, especially in spinal cord injury, of studying severe injuries. And uh, in my old chief, John Jane, uh, used to say, well, it's a crush cockroach. If you step on a cockroach, there's nothing you're going to do. There's a lot of those in Charlottesville. They were. There were. Those Yankees would come down there, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so why not study the mild injury? And we heard why not, and of course everyone's aware, in our uh, litigious world and our concern for safety, uh, perhaps paramount, that may inhibit us, but with our marginal treatments, perhaps we could discern that if we studied the mild injuries rather than the severe injuries. Time to response. You saw in the methylprednisolone, we, we were very proud of the fact we treated these patients within 14 hours. And I have a tape, but I couldn't find it, of a 14-year-old gymnast comes off the high bar, hits her neck incorrectly, gets a, a bilateral dislocation, brought in to see us within two hours. That was CT had just come in, MR hadn't. If MR was there, would have taken us another hour or so because we were <coughs> worried about, oh, we're going to get sued, et cetera. Instead, we just slammed tongs on her, yanked on her head. She walked out of the hospital, even though she was complete. Now, complete, by definition, is complete after 24 hours. So who knows? But. Without question, if you look at the, the uh, x-rays, the, the cord was really squeezed and she couldn't move. So I think one might say, okay, let's put the money into basic science, stem cell, etc. But in head injury, perhaps the reason that outcome has been improved is because there's in the field resuscitation for head injury. There's the intubation. And that's, you know, the military approach. So the question is,
could um, traction and so forth be applied in the field? But again, you're going to run into the concerns about safety and uh, issues of uh, liability. But nevertheless, it might be cost effective. Okay, here's the next thing. The question of do we rush forward with clinical trials <laughs> before we really have uh, substantial data? And you can tell the older folks are sort of laughing at this. Can you hear this? <laughs> so, by that, and I can think of several trials that turned out to be unsupportive, negative, uh, or, you know, non-active uh, non is the way the NIH uh, classifies them, that were rushed, rushed, because, uh, you know, everyone was saying, Jesus, we have got to stop... Uh, this kind of clinical treatment because it's unproven. But as uh, Wells says, there's no wine before it's time. We ought to be a little bit more thoughtful before we rush into a clinical trial uh, without the substantial data or the ability to know, okay, this group of patients shouldn't even be in the trial to begin with. Low back pain, shouldn't it? Maybe no treatment at all. But many of the spinal mm, uh, evaluations involve patients that require no, no treatment. Okay, uh, let me just say a few comments about preclinical uh, studies and the concerns. But the reality is um, there, many of the preclinical uh, trials, as reviewed by Tater, in a very comprehensive study in the Journal of Neurosurgery last month, uh, looking in particular at, in the spine. Uh, and I know people in this room were involved, and many of their articles, uh, the good articles, uh, showed up in, in that study. But many of these studies uh, appear, according to the authors, to be lacking in uh, strong scientific design. And in contrast to the human disease and diversity, laboratory studies use genetically pure strains. And if you would propose in a uh, grant to a study section that you're not going to use, uh, you know, rats uh, all of a, uh, one gender and so forth, you'd, you'd never get through. You'd be disallowed, not even reviewed. Frequently, the studies only include males and rarely large animals. And the, the point of this study by Tater and his colleagues are shown here, they, they reviewed uh, the literature, but they were looking at pharmacological therapy, not stem cells. So you guys are all off the hook. <laughs> the authors identified 246 articles, but only 26 were judged suitable for full text review based on the criteria they established but 22 of which were excluded after full review. They could only find four articles that fulfilled the rigid criteria for, quote, good science. That's their... So very few of the studies, randomized animals to treatment, were blinded or had independent assessment of outcomes, accounted for all their animals. And you, very few of them utilized uh, larger animals. And you know, we've already heard about the concerns and criticisms of using uh, mice, rats, um, and now heading back to dogs, which that's what I started out in, in vascular biology, using uh, dogs. And it's amazing we're heading back in that direction. So here's a quote from this authors, you can throw your bottles at them, not me, that there were major deficiencies in the effort that has been extended to coordinate and conduct preclinical neuroprotective pharmacotherapy trials in spinal cord injury. Only a small number of the articles have even attempted an overall evaluation of, of uh, these agents, and there's no consensus about how to select the agents for translation to humans on the basis of the preclinical performance. Man, I was astounded to read this. It just came out last month. 
And that's the basis for future therapy and clinical trials, at least in the neuroprotective area. Okay? And then lastly, just a few comments about spine versus brain. There are clear differences between trauma to the brain and trauma to the spinal cord, more than just ones here and, and ones here. Except for deep structures uh, in the brain and maybe eloquent cortex, the brain is less densely packed and therefore, without question, more tolerant of insults. However, within the brain, there's variation. So think about it. Slight injury to the optic uh, nerve, optic pathways, you're blind, especially the optic nerve. We know that from the operating room. But, and the same applies in, to the spinal cord, for that matter. But look at the corpus callosum. You can bang on the <laughs> corpus callosum all day, and we do, and it's a huge structure. But patients don't seem, unless you do sophisticated neuropsychological evaluation, you can't pick up the impairment. And then the disease pattern, which I've already referred to and others, that there are many minor head injuries, but there are very few, quote, minor spinal cord injuries. Again, I think it has to do with the sensitivity, density of packing, and so forth. So uh, there's just a clear difference. So just to uh, make sure that we're all left off the hook, it's not simply in spinal cord or head injury where these types of research problems uh, occur. So here's a study by Ron Alterman, colleague of mine, just published in the Annals of Neurology that they compared open versus double-blinded sham surgery using, and now here's my uh, one reference to uh, stem cells, human embryo from the mesencephalon porcine uh, embryo from the mesencephalon, human retinal pigment epithelium, glial-derived uh, neurotrophic factor, and uh, trophic factor nor norturin, uh, which, was got, which they implanted with a uh, <coughs> uh, viral vector. And so they looked at the unblinded studies, um, which shown here, had an average improvement, 36%. Now, all of these unblinded studies, I don't think any of them done by Giron and, no. Okay, so, uh, but nevertheless, all of these supported by startup companies, I think, by and large, they all went on to double-blinded clinical trials. And what happened? Here's the, here's the arm over here, placebo-controlled trials. In contrast to open label improvement of 35%, in the double blinded trials, improvement was only 17%, 50 to 70% less than the open results. And here's the other thing that I was thinking of with your presentation. Uh, there was no, as I said, no difference compared to improvement in sham outcome, but the risk <coughs> complication rate, which was zero in the open, label was much, much higher and significant in the randomized control trial. So I think this is really a cautionary note for us that are involved in uh, uh, clinical trials and our enthusiasm for um, uh, accepting the uh, open label trials. So their conclusions were as follows, that flaws were related to reliance on error-prone open-label assessment of clinical response, you need to have blinded evaluation, and too few patients to assess the efficacy and risk of intervention. So, but I am enthusiastic about spinal, uh, by, by cells, um, stem cells, stem cells. And the reason is because uh, at the Millennium, the Lancet, uh, asked 140 people to project 100 years ahead. And uh, I was asked to write on neurosurgery. And I said to the editor, well, why don't we make it 1,000 years, not 100? <laughs> and he, he said to me, Dick, why? I said, because nobody 
will remember me a thousand years from now and say, that guy didn't know what he was talking about. But in this article, my colleague and I, Matt Howard, who's the chair at Iowa, we actually said stem cells will cure spinal cord injury. So I need you guys, I need you guys to do it. Otherwise, we're going to remember who said it. Yes. So I would say lower the pro Can you hear that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Press the button. <laughs> who's got to figure out if they're going to, how, even how they're going to randomize people. It's the, the buck stops there, right? It, the, well, yes. <laughs> That's a different type of buck than the one you were talking about in the beginning. I should, can I ask one question? Yeah. So, back to the magnesium. So, your conclusion, of course, was too much of a good thing is bad. And I'm curious, what preclinical studies were used to establish the dose and dosing for the clinical trial? What, was it, what species and so forth? So, um, they were, most of the magnesium studies were done in rats. Mm -hmm. And they were equivalent doses. Actually, you talked about going from the lab to the clinic mm -hmm. and the clinic back. Their levels were based on the OBGYN uh, tolerable doses, you know, for preeclampsia and so forth. So, uh, and, and it just, it fit. And we thought we had covered the waterfront by doing a high and low level. Mm -hmm. Now, it may be that, for example, uh, an, uh, a bolus and not a prolonged treatment of magnesium mm -hmm. might work. But here's, here, here's another problem. There's no way that you could get funding from a study section since there have been three or four now, subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, at our study, stroke, absolutely no efficacy from magnesium. Now they've all followed a similar um, approach and the stroke one, um, they had an arm that was given out in the field. So you can't say we didn't, it wasn't that they didn't get started fast enough. Yeah, we'll just just uh, uh, a quarter therapeutics is currently doing a a uh, pegylated magnesium trial. They've reported that at, uh, out in spinal cord right. injury a couple month, two months ago. Yes, and they found that magnesium peg was effective. But guess what? I don't think the tr their lab study was blinded. Etc., and it was that was done in small animals, and I, you know my own, uh, you know I'm a physiologist, and probably for the last 15 years, every single one of our rat studies, looking at a denison and, and so forth, we've gone to total blinding, with one person having a key, the other person, yeah. uh, and it's not, folks. The key is not somebody working in the lab. Yeah. So the, a blinded person goes down, gets the animal, and even the, in our knockouts. Yeah. You know. All right. All right. We're going to have only a five minute break. One quick question? No. Okay. Yeah. So uh, one comment, I thought the, the comment about aging, I think, is particularly important because animal studies just it's <coughs> not You're been looked Pittsburgh at. You're pirates, uh, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, I always want to ask a real quick question about as a, a surgeon, you know, how far would you go uh, for blinded studies for cell therapy? I mean, is it uh, re-exposure? Uh, is there a needle poke involved? I mean, is there, have, is there, what, uh, how far should we go to really, as I think you made a very compelling... So those uh, movement disorder, uh, they yeah. were sham surgeries. So they, they get a needle prick. Yeah, you know, the, right at the they end, get a I burble, present, but they were all sham surgery yeah. trials. So they bur put a burr hole in. I don't know if they, um, I don't think they no. put anything through yeah. the brain. But they made a skin incision. Mm -hmm. Do you think we have to put something in the brain? 
I mean, that's, I guess, that's my question. <laughs> I mean, you've had... The Trump primates. Well, you know what? Uh, so there, there, were blind, there, were, there were randomized dual blind primate studies that exact, addressed the exact question, and the answer is no. You don't okay. see any effect if, in a true blinded study. When we were putting yeah. adrenal glands in <coughs> for, 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 for Parkinson's, Parkinson, what was found out yeah. was it wasn't the You could just go in and yeah. do something in the brain, and you would have... An a, effect. Yeah, and you would have an effect. So, um, so procedures may be enough. Controlling for a procedure, not necessarily. You know, Phil, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm not. Uh, I haven't looked into it in detail, so I wouldn't want to. Unlike when I was your boss, then I always was comfortable. An <laughs> 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 ex cathedris announcement, but not on that. All right. Thank you all. all right. We're going to take. Thank you very much.